Romans chapter 5, first five verses from New King James, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's pause there and pray. Father God, it is good to be in your house today to give thanks for who you are and for your word. Now as we study this passage together, we pray God you'd speak to our hearts, especially those who just need an extra measure of your hope today. We thank you for these verses that remind us of our hope in you. And so we commit our Bible study to you, Lord. Do your good work in all of our hearts now. We, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Paul starts out here in this passage of Romans chapter five, talking about having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody wants peace. You know, I, I've never met a person that really would rather have the opposite. <laughs> you know, give me some anxiety, give me some fear, that's what I would prefer. No, all of us want peace. And the fact is there are a lot of people who live without it. There are a lot of people who struggle with anxiety, who struggle with fear. And, um, and you know, I understand sometimes in the short term, medication might even be helpful with, with some of that. But in the long term, in the long term, the only way that you are really going to have abiding peace in your life is if you are at peace with God. And when you are at peace with God, then you have peace, peace with yourself and peace with others. But it will not happen until and unless you have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And the first thing that Paul writes about here in verse one is to tell us that we have that peace because we've been justified by faith. Notice that word justified. Now we've been talking about how the book of Romans sometimes reads like a law book and there's some big terms. And last week we defined the word justification, but I'm gonna throw it up on the screens again just so we can know what this means to say that we're justified by faith. Justification is a formal acquittal by God whereby he pronounces a a sinner to be righteous because of that sinner's faith in Christ. And, and an easy way to remember the word justified is if you break down the word. Very simple way to remember. What does this mean? Because uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, that God made him who knew no sin, meaning Jesus, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means that God, because of his love for us, sent his son Jesus. When we put our faith and trust in him, our sins and the punishment that we deserve are transferred to Jesus on the cross and the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us so that when God looks at us, because of our faith in Jesus, he sees us in the righteousness of his son and it's, here it comes, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. That's an easy way to remember the word. Because in Christ, his righteousness has been imputed to me. So when God looks at me, it's in that sense just as if I'd never sinned. He sees us in the righteousness of his son. That's justification. And Paul says here that justified in, by faith in Christ is what brings us peace with God. But this is important. And for you note takers, you can jot this down. But being at peace with God does not imply the absence of suffering. Because that's the rest of what he's going to talk about here. So I'll say it again. Being at peace with God does not imply the absence of suffering. The presence of peace does not mean the absence of suffering. And this is what Paul means in verse 3 when he starts talking here about tribulations. Tribulations is the word used there in verse 3. Now again, I'm reading New King James. If you have an ESV or an NIV, it translates it uh, even, even more strongly and uses the word sufferings. That's what he's talking about. 
He's talking about the sufferings that we will sometimes experience in this world because we live in the world. Listen to me on this. A sin-free life does not mean a carefree life. And by sin-free, I'm not implying that Christians no longer sin. You know, when we're redeemed because of our faith in Jesus, we are forgiven. But we will still be tempted and we will still at times sin. Thank God we can go to him because we have an advocate who freely forgives us of our sins. But when I say sin free, it just means, look, Christians are not sinless, but Christians, because you want to honor God and show your love for Jesus, should sin less. Everybody understand that? And that's the big distinction here. Jesus even said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. The way we show our love for Christ is because we sin less, but it doesn't mean we're sinless. So when I say a sin-free life doesn't mean a carefree life, that's what I'm talking about. We sin less because we love God and we want to honor Him. But it does not mean that now all of a sudden we have no struggles and we just live a carefree life. In fact, Jesus even links the two together, His peace and the world's tribulation, and says, guess what, we're going to get both. In John 16, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So he says, in me you will have peace. But he says, in the world you're going to have tribulation. And guess what? Because we're in Christ living in the world, it means we have both his peace and the world's tribulation at the same time. And that word tribulation that, Je- that Jesus uses there in John 16, is the Greek word in the original language, the lipsis, which is the same word in Romans chapter 5 when Paul talks here in verse 3 about tribulation. He says, we're going to have sufferings. The peace of God is important. We've got to get that first. But just because you have the peace of God doesn't mean that it will be absent the sufferings of the world. The good news, however, is that in Christ, a relationship with Christ, we have been given something, we have an advantage that the rest of the world doesn't have. And the advantage that we have in Christ is that he has given us something to better manage the pain and the sufferings of this world. And it is, in a word, what Paul uses here also, hope. We have a hope that the world does not have and cannot offer us that we can gain in Christ. And in those verses I read at the top of our study, verses one through five, the word hope is found three times. You can look at it there in your Bibles. Just circle the first five verses, just find it. Circle the words hope, the three times it appears in the first five uh, verses of Romans chapter five. By the way, the word hope appears more in the book of Romans than any other New Testament book. And in fact, when you look at proportionally, the only book that mentions hope more than the book of Romans is the book of Psalms. Well, the book of Psalms has 150 chapters. So proportionally, Romans even has hope mentioned more than any other book in the entire Bible when you look at it proportionally. So this is a great word that God wants us to see and understand and Paul writes about here. Notice in your Bibles there, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, got that. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So there's the first time the word's used here in chapter 5. Hope. That's the hope we're talking about. Now, if you're old enough to remember, remember when Obama was running for president and his theme was keep hope alive, you know, keep hope alive, okay? The question becomes, wh- where does hope come from? Because if I can keep hope alive, that implies I can kill hope. Because you see, the world's idea of hope is it's up to you. It's up to you to get it. It's up to you to maintain it. It's up to you to keep it. And so the burden that the world places on people is that if you want to be hopeful, that has to come from within. That's on you. That's a mental disposition. That's a positive attitude. That's the thing you got to conjure up somewhere deep within you. And that's the best the world has to offer. That hope is basically a positive mental attitude. But can I tell you that when you're looking here with me at this Bible study together in Romans... 
When Paul speaks here of hope, whenever you read in the Bible about hope, it is not some mental attitude. It is a spiritual reality. And that spiritual reality of hope that we can gain is through Christ. It's knowing the Lord. It's what he gives us. Hope is basically a firm reliance on God. It is a firm reliance on God. J.B. Phillips said it this way. He said, hope is a happy certainty, a happy certainty. You know that old hymn of our faith that many of us have sung over the years, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand, right? Our hope is in the Lord. And He gives us a measure of His hope and His presence and His calm assurance. The world can't offer that. The world's going to just tell you to, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and, you know, bring it up from within and just keep hope alive. Listen, This is a spiritual reality that is available to all through faith in Christ. David would write this in Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. And so Paul says here in Romans 5, Christian rejoice because you get hope as part of the deal. Because of your relationship with Christ, among all the wonderful benefits that we have in Christ, One of the beautiful benefits is you get hope. But please notice, as he writes here, you got to go through some stuff to get there. And so, again, just another simple point for you taking notes. Hope is born out of suffering, but it is not a direct path. Hope is born out of suffering, but it is not a direct path. Look in your Bibles at verses 3 and 4 again. Verse 3 says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Some of your translations say we rejoice in sufferings, knowing that tribulation or suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And notice what he says there. He's basically saying you can't have hope until you first have character. And you won't have character until you persevere. And you're not going to persevere unless you have tribulations. And so it's like a stepping stone to hope. So what we're going to talk about today is the stepping stones to hope. Because it starts with being at peace with God. But he says, and then it progresses through this, these stages of you got suffering, you got perseverance, you got character, and then we get to hope. So hope is born out of suffering, but it's not a direct path. There are some things along the way that we have to learn and understand in order to really embrace and, and experience the peace of God. So we're going to look at those stepping stones. And the first one is suffering, suffering. In order to get to hope, we have to, I'm going to use this phrase, some of you might think that's a weird phrase, but listen, we have to learn to suffer well. Now, what does that mean, to suffer well? How does a person suffer well? I think one of the best examples in the Bible of somebody who suffered well, apart from our Lord, is a guy whose very name means persecuted one. In Hebrew, his name is pronounced Yov, we would say Job. And the whole book of Job is a testimony of a man who was faithful to God despite his many sufferings that he endured. Now, I'm not going to make this a Bible study about Job, but I do want to just highlight four particular things I think that stand out about how he suffered well. Number one, he did not blame God. Okay, please don't get in the blame game, church. When things happen to you, don't blame God. It's really easy to go there. It's really easy to, you know, get mad at God. But this is one thing that Job shows us that he did well. He didn't blame God. Number two, he did not listen to his lame friends who tried to explain his suffering. He had some lame friends. We all have some lame friends. And they're all going to try to explain things to us. You know, there's just some things that don't need explanation. And, and you make matters worse when you try to explain it. And don't be that lame friend for somebody else, okay? Don't try, you know, Job had these friends who came around him and said, well, you know, Job, you know, the reason why you're suffering is probably there's sin in your life and it's probably this and that. And they're, they're all pontificating, trying to explain Job's suffering. They needed to keep their mouths shut is what they needed to do. And, and God, even at the end of the book of, of Job, corrects them. 
and basically says those friends didn't know what they were talking about. Because we don't necessarily have the perspective, of course, that God has. And so we, you know, sometimes we make up things and we try to rationalize things and, and some stuff just, you know, don't need to be explained. Some things don't need to be explained. And so, and, and Job didn't listen to, to his friends who tried to explain his suffering. Number three, Job acknowledged that man is limited in his understanding. I, I, again, quoting J.B. Phillips, I think he was the one who said, if God were big enough for me to understand, he wouldn't be uh, big enough for me to worship. Uh, sorry, if God, weren't, weren't, uh, if God were small enough for me to understand, he wouldn't be big enough for me to worship. You know, there is at a point we have to realize God is God, we're not, we have limited understanding. There are some things this side of heaven that will not make sense. We have limited understanding. There are things right now going on in your life. You're like, this does not make sense. And it's okay to acknowledge it doesn't make sense. God, his understanding is greater than ours. And this side of heaven, we may never understand certain things that happen. And, and Job just released that. He's like, I, I have limited understanding. God had to kind of discipline him to get him to realize, okay, I have limited understanding. But he came to that place where he realized, you're God, I'm not. And number four, Job learned that you can't control what is uncontrollable. Something's happened and, it, and it's nobody's fault. Some of you have been blaming yourself for too long for something that you shouldn't be blaming yourself about. There are things that, are, that happen that are beyond our control. You, you suffer through it nevertheless, but there are just some things that happen that are beyond our control. So what did Job do? He pressed into God. He's like, Lord, you're all I, you're all I have. And he made bold declarations to put his faith into practice. And in the middle of the book of Job, in Job chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, listen to what Job says. In the midst of his suffering, he says this, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. He's like, nobody's going to see God on my behalf. I and not another means I'm going to see him myself because all, of all the things that are happening in my life and all these things that are, that are miserable and terrible and all the suffering, there's one thing I'm holding on to, one day I'm going to see the Lord. And he's going to stand before me because I know that my Redeemer lives. And my, my hope is in him. And so he presses into the Lord. Because see, when... When we are suffering, if you want to suffer well, it really depends on your response to the situation, how you react to the situation. Consider this. Um, when you have a, a pot of boiling water and you take an egg and a potato and you put both of those into the same pot of boiling water, the same circumstances result in two opposite responses. The egg gets harder, the potato gets softer. People are the same. I've seen people who are suffering the exact same thing, they are subject to the exact same environment, situation, and some people get hardened like an egg, they get angry at God, they get callous, and other people, same situation, become very tender, they become humble, they become broken. Why is that? It's because of how you respond to it. It's how you react to it. And Spurgeon said it this way, he said, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. The same sun, but two responses, the wax melts, the clay gets harder. And so the response is up to us. Our response is our responsibility. And when faced with suffering, and look, in saying this, I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not, I'm not, you know, shaming anybody that's been through difficulties. I'm just saying this on behalf of all of us. When faced with suffering, we have a choice. We can either allow the suffering 
to humble us and to tenderize us. Or we can get angry with God and become hard-hearted. And that's, that's up to us. If we are to suffer well, you see, it leads to the next thing. Suffering produces perseverance. Suffering produces perseverance. And if, number two on the list, if, if suffering is about pressing in to the Lord, then perseverance is about pressing on with the Lord. Perseverance is the decision every day you get up and, and you're going to say, not today, Satan. It's getting up every day and still going on. It's still trusting. It's still praying. It's still leaning on Jesus no matter what things might look like. It's like, Lord, in the morning, so hard to just when you're facing something difficult to just press on, but it's a decision, I'm just gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep trusting, I'm gonna keep praying, I'm gonna keep leaning on Jesus, no matter what things look like. Listen to what James said in his epistle, James chapter one, two to four, he said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. This is what comes out of trials. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, now James starts what I just read there by saying, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. What do you, what do you mean consider it pure joy? I mean, are you supposed to dance? Are you supposed to throw a party when you're going through some kind of suffering? No, listen, Albert Barnes said it this way. He said, consider it pure joy means we are not to consider it as a punishment, a curse, or a calamity. There are a lot of people who don't persevere because they think that what they're going through is God's punishment. And Satan wants you to believe that. Because if Satan can derail you and cause you to give up, then you'll never really experience the hope that God has for you. So he wants you to just always be under shame, always under a cloud of guilt. This is probably my fault and God's probably punishing me and, and, and God took my child because of that one mistake I made years ago. I mean, all these kind of things that start to impact our hearts and we have to stop that because the enemy loves to play games with our head and make us think that you don't need to persevere because this is all your fault anyway. Perseverance is recognizing and considering it pure joy means this is not the result of a bad God. This is the result of a fallen world. And in fact, God is good and he's gonna see me through this. That's considering it pure joy and persevering and pressing on because God will never leave me nor forsake me. That's where the joy comes in. And James will later add further in James chapter one, verse 12. He says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So sometimes God has to take us through the desert to strengthen our faith. Perseverance then produces, number three, character. On our way to hope is character. The legendary UCLA basketball coach John Wooden probably said it best when he said this, quote, worry more about your character than your reputation. Character is who you are. Reputation is merely who others think you are, end quote. In other words, who you are when no one else is looking, that's character. There are actually very few times in the Bible when the word character is used. And that's because the Bible focuses more on the qualities of character instead of the word character itself. Qualities like humility, qualities like honesty, integrity, sincerity. Those are the qualities the Bible challenges us about and they result in us having character, but it's those qualities we need to grow in. Perseverance produces character because we gain those qualities as stuff is purged out of our lives. That's how character is built. Suffering has a natural tendency to expose stuff in our hearts that either we didn't know was there or didn't want to acknowledge was there. Anybody relate to what I'm saying? When you go through something difficult, it, it exposes stuff. I know that's true in my life. 
suffering or difficulties or something that you go through ends up exposing stuff that you're like, oh, I didn't even know this was here, or you knew it was there, but you didn't want to acknowledge it, but the suffering part and persevering through it forces you to have to deal with it now. In fact, the word tribulation in our English language comes from a Latin word, tribulum. Tribulum was a flat board in the Roman Empire that had spikes on it. And they would attach the flat board that had spikes underneath, they'd attach it to an animal like an ox or a horse, and they would drag it across a field to separate the wheat from the chaff. If you've ever been to a, a professional baseball game and they, and they often have those, I don't even know what they're called, but, it, but you see the field workers out before the game and they, they're dragging this kind of a mesh screen-like thing that's probably, I don't know, six feet wide or whatever, and they drag it through the infield, uh, the dirt over the infield, and it separates like the little pebbles and makes the dirt smooth and looks really nice, and then they hose it down and everything. Well, a tribulum is kind of like that mesh that they drag drag across the dirt of the infield. The tribulum, though, has the spikes, but dragging it across the grain separates the wheat from the chaff. That's what tribulation does. It starts to separate the junk, the chaff of our lives, and exposes stuff and separates it from what is right, from the things that are wrong in our hearts, the things that are good from the things that are bad. And then when we persevere and we deal with those things, it's like a refining work and character is developed through suffering. You look in the Bible, and you look at different people who experience suffering, you can see their character, can't you? I mean, Job was a man of character because of his suffering. Ruth, in fact, in the NIV, it says Ruth was a woman of noble character because she suffered much, and yet she persevered. Paul was a man of character who suffered much. Jesus, of course, suffered much and showed great character. Why? Because all of them persevered. They persevered, they kept going. And finally it produces hope. Hope is one of the most critical things in life. There are a lot of people in our world without it. People in despair, people feeling lost, suicidal, People dealing with grief or a broken heart or physical pain. I mean, you name it, there are a lot of people in this world who suffer in silence. You can't always spot them. They often look just like you and me. They don't, they don't always let on about just how deep beneath the surface things are brewing. And they have no hope. What makes God's hope so special and unique is that it comes out of his love for us. And that's the last verse in our text, verse five. Notice in your Bibles, verse five, now hope does not disappoint, why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's love poured out into our hearts. The reason we have hope is, is because God so loves us. And he has poured out his love into our hearts. There, there are a couple times in the book of Ephesians that Paul breaks out into a prayer. And one of those prayers is in Ephesians chapter 3. And he says, I pray that you would know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now that seems like a contradiction. How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? In other words, that it would be so experiential that you wouldn't even be able to rationally explain it, but yet you know it and experience it because the love of God and the depth of his love, that you would know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's God's love. Do you know how much he loves you? Because he has poured out his love, and that love is what gives us such great hope. There's a confident expectation that God's got this because God's got me. God's got you. The reason you can be at hope is because you know the Lord 
And because you can remind yourself, God's got this because he's got me. And near the end of this book of Romans, if you'll glance ahead to chapter 15, I want to close with this verse as our prayer, and then we're actually going to sing today. But Romans 15, verse 13, I want you to see this prayer with me. Romans 15, verse 13 says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's Romans 15, 13. Now I wanna encourage you like underline that verse, go home during the week, pray over that verse, meditate on it and ask the Lord, to allow his hope to abound in your life because of what Jesus has done. Now, late last night I texted Pastor Ben. I said, Ben, I said, um, the worship team's gonna come right now. I, I said, uh, I got this song I think we need to sing. And uh, so they rapidly put it together this morning. It's a song we've sung often, Hope Has a Name. And I just felt the Lord was saying to me last night, you know, normally I close every service with prayer. And on a, on a teaching like this, I would probably specifically want to pray for those who just need an extra measure of hope. But late last night, I just felt the Lord speak to my heart saying, I want everybody to declare my hope in the house of the Lord and for you to sing it out. And in that way, God will minister his hope to you. And so I'm gonna ask all of us to stand. Let's all stand. And we're gonna sing this song together, Hope Has a Name. And I just wanna encourage you, if you're feeling low on hope today, sing even louder. <laughs> no, seriously, sing even louder. And if you feel the liberty, lift your hands as we're singing this song, because I want us in the house of the Lord to declare that hope does have a name. His name is Jesus, and may his hope invade us. May it abound over us because that's what his word tells us. May we receive it today as we worship him, as we give praise to him. So come on church, Steph's gonna lead us, let's just worship. i
Lord, this is our declaration in your house that you are the God of all hope who pours out your hope abundantly because of Christ who has set us free. Lord, for those who especially need an extra measure of your hope, as we have sung that song in your house, I know that you have poured out your hope into our hearts today so that we can be sent home on our way, filled up with the measure of the fullness of God. Thank you, Lord, that you give us what the world offers us but cannot deliver. You give us your hope in Christ. Help us to suffer well, to persevere, to be men and women of character, that we might know your hope. And his name is Jesus. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.